apparently water is what's up today. All right. Now I'll get ready to switch over to developing courses. So let's see how this looks. Great. All right, here I am. <laughs> no rewinds. Yeah, there are, there are no rewinds today, Genghis. There's there's only many, many double bogeys. All right, I'm just gonna check the threads real quick, see if any other questions came in, and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, looks like I'm all caught up, so. <clears throat> all right, so I'll start the recording somewhere around here, so. <clears throat> Hi everyone, I'm Chad Golf, and welcome to the Golf Club 2019 LiDAR import tool and other TGC designer tools tutorial. I will be your one and only source of entertainment, Chat Golf, and we will discuss how to find LiDAR for your course, how to get started with your course in OpenStreetMap, how to bring it all together, and then tips, tricks, and solutions from the community, what to do when things go wrong and where to get help. And then also I'll be taking questions throughout the entire course. So if you're live on Twitch right now, log in, get a username and just ask in the box and let me know. Our first question is from Wbond1. Do I use an Xbox controller or keyboard? I use an Xbox controller. I got this nice pretty green one with nice lines it was open box at best buy and ever since then i have stopped saving money because i bought all of the accessories i personally really like the dongle for windows i think that it connects a little easier because i switch computers a lot i've got a gaming pc here but i also do a lot of work on the road with my laptop and i think that the dongle just makes it easier to pair and reconnect because it's a two button tap and i don't have to go through any menus and for designing i think that you should definitely try to use xbox at least for me um, when i develop on pc i can do a little bit with mouse and keyboard but the, a lot of the keyboard shortcuts are something like control scroll wheel or alt shift scroll wheel and it's a lot more difficult to sort of do those without getting hand fatigue after a while and then the other big thing is especially when you're placing hard to place things like water hazards or the little water sheets then i find that it's um way easier to use the right stick here on the Xbox controller in order to move the camera around while fine tuning the positioning with the left stick because when you use the mouse, it's all the mouse. So as you're trying to move the camera, your water might jump around on you a little bit. And so I just find that it's more accurate and faster to use the Xbox controller. And you can see the Xbox controller there in the lower corner and yep. It looks like it's working, so you can see my button presses as I go later. All right, so the first step is I'm going to go into my tool, and I will just sort of show the first page, and then we'll walk through it that way. All right, so this is sort of the first panel that you see. And so I kind of intended for you to start at the top and work down as well as work left to right. So this is the first page that you want to start from. And you can see the first thing we need is select course directory. And so this is the directory that you'll use for all of your temporary files and sort of using your course. And so here, uh, I like to put in documents, I just put like a folder called TGC designer courses and I just have uh, folders for every course and so if I wanted a new course I could do like 
something like that. And that would be the course directory that you could choose. So you can select it. It's just the directory. Nothing has to be in there right now, but that tells us where we want to start. Um, the other thing that I like to do to get things set up is you notice Windows has these little pin icons. And so the two things that I like to pin are, let's see. I like to go to C, users, your name, and then go to app data, local low, and if you're using Steam on PC, it'll be 2K. And if you're using the simulator, it'll be Pro T. But go to 2K, 2K Golf Club 2019 courses. And I like to right click on courses and pin to quick access. And that will put this folder over here so that you can click on it and access it quickly no matter where you are. I think that that's a big time saving tip and that it helps you get around in the editor. And then the other thing I like to pin is my courses directory. So you can see that I have my sort of working copy and then I have the game's copy itself. We have a question. Is there any way to get the LiDAR data from PC to Xbox One or PS4? Wondering if some sort of Xbox or PSN login could be added to your program and if we could export publish it to the TGC servers. Perhaps the LiDAR course would be linked to our console account, which would let us grab it and edit it on console. So unfortunately, there's no way that we're aware of currently to get an editable course onto Xbox or PlayStation. So when you, the only reason that any of this is possible is that we can access the course files on PC. Now, you can edit and complete the courses on PC and publish them on PC. And when that happens, they will publish and be playable on the consoles and then eventually also the simulator. But I think that as part of the contract between the game companies and uh, Microsoft for the Xbox and Sony for the PlayStation, they have to strip personally identifiable information. And so it all shows up as TGC user as the publisher. And I don't think they have cross-platform login. Um, and so even for simulator, I think the way that we recommend um, publishing, and feel free to correct me in the chat, is you can work entirely on the Steam version for PC, and then that you can publish there, which takes care of Steam, Xbox, and PS4. And you can also then take that course and publish it on simulator, and then you can get it quickly on simulator. So now I'm going to start up the game and I'm going to show you how I get a course ready to go to use in the tool. Okay, so if you haven't used the editor before, then you can use these buttons up here to navigate the menu. And you go all the way over to Designer here on the top, and then you go down to New Course. And so we'll go ahead and select New Course. All right. And then so here you can give your course a name and I'm going to call it my first goat track. Great. Perfect course. And theme, um, Crazy Canuck has a bunch of good information on the designer and that's kind of out of scope for me. But I'm going to go ahead and pick step just because it's my favorite, and I think that that's how the courses look like the most dynamic. So for terrain, the good news is that all of this stuff here is completely compatible with the LiDAR input and designer, and so you can set these to whatever you want. But in general, just to make things look clean, I'm gonna bring them all down to zero. But you can always come back here 
and um, change these in it and most of them will apply, some of them won't, and we can get into that later. And so the real problem is this. So right now we've got 18 holes, and if we try to import another course on top of this one that's already been generated, it's not gonna work out well. So at the very least, you need to select number of holes, drag it down to zero, and confirm, and now it'll go through and delete all of these when I press apply. So now we have a course that's ready to be used in the editor. And then the LiDAR input. And... And I have a technical issue where I can't move the camera. Okay. Well, oh, I know why. So. Now that we are in sort of this one, I'm gonna show you some settings that I like to do. So the first one is I like to go into controls and my default controller, I like to make gamepad. And that's just because I use the Xbox controller and it makes sure that things like, I bump the mouse a little bit and then I lost control with the joypad. Um, and then the other thing is in course designer default hole count since i deal with all of the different uh like i'm making a bunch of blank courses i go ahead and i drag this to zero and then i also make the gamepad the default controller here and with both of these things done it makes it a lot easier to uh to work with the courses because now I'll just go ahead and leave this course to so save and exit. And then now we'll make another new course and I'll show you how things have changed. So we'll make a new course, we'll call it, and this is the course that we'll try to make today live on stream. So I'll call it Rancho. And it's theme, it probably is a it's like a Southern California course, so we'll probably call it like probably like a boreal or a rustic, but we'll go with boreal. Um, and then terrain again, you can set these to whatever you want. Yeah, I know the boreal sand traps don't look that great. Do you want me to go ahead and make it a desert course even though it's not? Because that's what I like to do. And the good news is, is that you can change the theme and everything later. So if you have no idea what you're doing, just pick something that looks okay or that you think is fun and then you can go in and edit it later. And so I'll go ahead and just make it a, <laughs> a desert course. And you notice now that we set number of holes the default to zero, so now we don't have to remove anything unless we want to remove this one little clubhouse. So I'll apply and we'll continue. All right, and so I'll just go over to the edit menu, select clubhouse and delete that thing. All right, so now I'm ready to go. Here's our course. It looks great. And so you can see on the controller, like I have, I can fly around and, you know, do a lot of different sophisticated kind of camera work. And in general, going through this little menu with these little clicky buttons and the joypad, I think is a lot easier to use, but it's just a personal preference. All right, so now we'll save and exit, confirm. All right, so now we'll exit the game and we'll start the path of building our course. So now you notice in courses, which I have pinned to quick access. We've got two courses. One was created at 542, which was our goat track. And then our rancho was 544 with date modified. So I'll delete our goat track. And then this one, I'll go ahead and rename it and I'll call it rancho. All right. And now I'll take this course and I'll go to my documents my course folder and I'm just gonna plop this course file here 
and you can see that I've pre-prepared things. So imagine we're like on Food Network and there's not enough times. <laughs> so we put that there. So now we've selected our course directory for Rancho. And now we can import this course file. And so this does a few things. This expands the course so that we know what we're looking at. It draws a preview here of what the course will look like and it gets us ready to start the next process. And so now comes the hardest part of this whole process, but thankfully there's a lot of people in the community who have been helpful and can guide people through how to do this, but we have to find our LiDAR data. And so the sites for North America that I like are the NOAA Interagency LiDAR and the national map and so whenever I make a course within the United States I go here to the NOAA interagency elevation inventory and I zoom in on the course and I just see what kind of data is available or will be available soon and so for instance um, with this one, what we'll do is we'll, go, we'll zoom in and I like to set my base map to be street so I can have some idea of where I'm zooming for now. And then as I get closer and I go, oh, okay, I, I, I know and I can recognize where the course is, I switch it to satellite imagery. And then I zoom in until I look around and I try to find the course. And so right here underneath this yellow, which is kind of hard to see, um, is our course. So you can see here's our driving range. And then here's the first few holes. And it goes all the way down here. And then this course has a little um, three holes that comes out over here. And so now what we want to do is we can just click anywhere in this course and click identify. And now we can look and we can see what the different LiDAR is available here and which ones we can use. And so I always like to start with the most recent. So for this one, it's 2013. And I look at it and I see, okay, it's 2013. So that was five or six years ago, but it's a Topobathy LiDAR merge project. And so this one, I don't know if I necessarily want to use it, because it has various collection dates, but the data sets were merged in 2013. So that means that the data might come from different times. And one of the things that I really try to make sure is that all of my LiDAR data, if possible, is from the same collection, which means basically that it was all paid for under one grant and it was collected within a couple months of all the rest of the data and that basically makes sure that all of your metadata will be the same, your projection will be the same, and your uh, your um, uh, quality will be the same. Because if you mix different types of LiDAR data, then you can get different results. Uh, and it can make things like greens play differently from one side of the green to the other. And Genghis asks if IFSAR is usable if there's no LiDAR. And yes, as long as the data comes in in either an LAS or an LAZ format for now, then you can use all of the different possible LiDAR um, types. Like if we go out to the water, there's almost always this um, like bathymetric LiDAR available and you can see that that is sometimes usable. And then there's also um, like this California coastal LiDAR, and sometimes these are mixed. And if your course fits within all of them, then it's okay. But usually what I find is even for coastal courses, like if we go down the road here to um, uh, Pelican Hill, which is right here, you can see that like parts of the north course and various holes aren't entirely within this, this shoreline collection. 
The CLV24 asks, what is the best quality level? Does the scale go up or is a higher number better? And I believe that a higher number is better, but I think that it only goes up to three, but I'm not, I don't work professionally with LiDAR, so I can't say with complete certainty, but we can check these and kind of see. So there's 2002, which is, it says it's quality level four, but what I was thinking of was 3DEP, which is a interagency collection by the US government. And you can go here and it's the 3D elevation program. And this will probably answer the questions about, no, I don't want the survey, <laughs> about um, what the different quality levels are. In general, I haven't been too concerned because I tend to just take whatever the latest is because it tends to be the highest quality anyways. And being the most recent, it's the most likely to not have any major changes to the courses. Now, of course, this is a good time to talk about how the age and year of your LiDAR collection can affect your course. And so one of the things, for instance, is that eventually I would like to try to work a little bit on a couple of the banding courses or the stream song courses, but some of them are kind of new. And so if the LiDAR data comes before your course was created or opened, you're not gonna get any of those elevation changes or different uh, landscaping that the architect may have done. And so you probably won't get good results and it probably can't be used. But the flip side is, is let's say you used to have a local course or a course that you played on um, when you were younger or before you moved that's now closed down the LiDAR data will be there forever. So if you have LiDAR from a time when the course existed, then you can actually import that course before all the houses went up. So it's kind of a double-edged sword there. Um, but I strongly encourage everyone to look at the 3DEP website. Uh, and it's pretty cool all the different things that you can do. And especially I like these product availability maps because they tell us what's available and what's coming. And so specifically, we want to look not at DEMs, but in terms of classified LiDAR point clouds. And so if we look at this one, you can see here that the blue is the best data. And so the quality is really starting to get there and we're starting to get a lot of the country covered. And here are the recent updates. And so this would be a great place to go and look for courses that you know that may have just gotten LiDAR data. Like I know sometime in 2019, they're expected to publish all of Florida, which is really exciting because it's gonna be recent and high quality data. So now back to our hunt for LiDAR. So this one, if I wanted the merged LiDAR, I'll select it and then it says data access NOAA Digital Coast. So I just click on it and it brings up this website. And so now we have to uh, zoom in because this is what will actually give us our data. Let's see, and I think I want imagery. Or no, sorry, that wasn't uh, changing the map. That was changing what I was requesting. Let's see. I don't know the coast that well, but we'll zoom in somewhere around here. I think that's San Diego. All right. Everyone can watch me as I'm super lost from... Wait, am I in? Well, when all else fails, just try the search.
There we go. Perfect. Done. <laughs> Didn't have to break a sweat. All right, so you can see here that this is our golf course. And so what I'll do is I know the bounds of the golf course a little better. So I'm going to draw a box sort of like this. Perfect. So now we can look over here and we can find which product we want. And it's this is the one that I think it said we saw. So I'll click it. I'll add to cart. And this is just how to use this tool. I want it, I'm not going to use this today, but I wanted to have everyone see how this was done because there's some very important questions that could be answered on this one. And so now this, this is, we've selected a region and the LiDAR. And so now this pops up some stuff and this is where we need to take a step back and go, Phew, okay. This is a lot of complicated things. And so if you ever are in the situation where you have to select stuff and it's not provided to you in a fixed format, we have to choose it. So projection is how the points are turned from latitude longitude into left, right, forward, back. And if you've ever seen the different map projections and you know that like the globe and like how Greenland and Iceland appear really big, but then things on the equator are really small and nothing's the right size. That's this. And this is the biggest pain in all of the LiDAR selection. And if I ever have a choice, I choose UTM because it's the sort of international standard. There's only so many ranges and the ranges are automatic based on where you are. And so the next thing is that zone 11 is of course the one that auto selects for california and that's correct and it's the only one that's correct these don't worry about them now these they have to match so you should definitely try to choose meters and meters if you choose utm make sure that your vertical units match your horizontal units and now output products what we want are points and you can choose LAS or LAZ. And so another question that people have often is, what is an LAS file and how is it different from an LAZ file? And if you're familiar with what a .zip file is, it's basically that. An LAZ file is it takes all of the different points and then it compresses them into a much smaller download. And that's something that you usually are okay with and what you want. Um, and the tool will handle both because oftentimes you're not given a choice and you just have to choose one. And, and so it doesn't really make a difference. It's just that if you run it a lot, uh, it does have to expand the LAZ files. So if you can burn up disk space, maybe choose LAS and it might run a little bit faster initially, but otherwise choose LAZ. Okay, and then now data classes, you want all data classes if they're available and hit next. And then so you would enter your, e your email and then Noah will run a server and they'll find the points of the box you selected and then they'll send you a custom link that you can download if your data is available from Noah. But the one we're gonna choose today is not the merge project but we're going to choose I believe this one the Orange County LiDAR and so this one says it's available on NOAA Digital Coast which we just used or the national map and Digital Coast if you can get comfortable with ordering the LiDAR custom you might choose to use that, but I usually just choose the national map. Um, and for some reason that 404, but that's okay. Usually that works, but we can go to it on our own. So I've switched over to the national map page. And what I want to do is go to the national map viewer. I think this is right. 
and then click data download. And so this is the page that you eventually want to end up on. And this is what the link would have sent us, the national map download. And it has to be the download. And you'll notice all the different things that you can get. And so what we'll do is click this button. And then I like imagery again, because you can see how terrible I am and I get I got lost at the other map when it wasn't labeled and so I'll just keep going in and I think I see our course uh, ha ha this is our course so this is the course that we'll be working on today so I'll zoom out a little bit so it's all visible then I'll click box slash point and now it says click and drag to draw a rectangle so I'll give myself a little bit of buffer and I'll click and drag and I'll make sure the whole course is covered here and so now on the left panel, I'll go to Elevation Source 3D EP LiDAR. And this is the one you have to check. And make sure that LiDAR Point Cloud is checked. So now we'll hit Find Products. And it's popped up with a list. And now what I always do is I check the year and sort of the project. So this is Orange County, California in 2011. And I look through, yes, yes, and they're all the same. If they come from different years, then you should be careful to download only the years that you're interested in. If you try to mix and match, you could get bad results. And so you have a couple things here, and the one I like to click is called Footprint. And so you can see here that it pops up a box and it shows where that LiDAR covers. And you can see this one actually almost covers the whole course on its own. But unfortunately, we need to click footprint on the rest. And you can see that if you were re being really cautious, then, uh, oh, we've got a follow, thank you, MP1972, that this would cover, but it gets awfully close right here to missing a practice bunker. And I wouldn't want to you know miss out on the practice bunker or have an awkward corner in the range so i'll go ahead and use this last one all right so with my four footprints that should be all the area that i need so now i'll go through each of these that i've clicked footprint on and i'll add them to my cart and then you can click view cart and then there are all of your information and so they offer a couple different links here and so we'll click on all three of them to show you what the difference is. And so if you click on metadata, then you can see this is actually kind of like, I don't know, I think of it as a Facebook page for this block of LiDAR data because it gives you everything that you need to know. It gives you a quick render preview. It gives you the actual sort of location about where it is. And it gives you the ability to download the XML metadata file here and the LAZ and LAS, which you could download from the previous page or not. And if we open the zip file, you can see the zip file actually includes both the XML and the LAS. And so if you're in it for just convenience, you can download just the LAS file here from the cart and that'll give you both. But the reason I don't recommend that is that I believe they're gonna be removing that later this year to save bandwidth. And so the LAZs may become the default and only choice you get. And so once you download all of those, then what you can do is go into your data and, or your downloads, and then you would select the different files. In this case, I chose the LAZ and the XML earlier and I downloaded that XML again from clicking this. And in general, what you can do is find any type of file you want, as long as it's not the duplicate. So don't do the LAZ and the LAS, but anything that you get in like an archive or in a zip, like you can just take every file, like even if there were three or four other files, and just throw them into your project folder and the tool do its best to find the information that it needs from any of the available files. 
but specifically currently the ones that it uses are LAS or LAZ, which contain your actual points, XML, which sometimes contain the projection and the complicated math information that we need to make everything right, or sometimes there's something called a .prj file. Go ahead and throw that in too, because that will directly include the projection. And Frodetti has a question about how much slower would you say the tool takes to load LAZ versus LAS? I've only ever used LAS files. And it depends on the size of your file. So for instance, these ones are 83 megabytes for the LAS, but they are, um, let's find out, 28 megabytes for the LAZs. So they're about three times smaller, but they don't take three times longer to load. I would say that it's probably about an extra five or 10 seconds per file. So in this case, it would maybe be an extra minute during the unloading. But for some files, the sizes can be really big. Like there can be compressed LAZ files that are over 200 megabytes. And so for those, it can take significant time. The good news is, is that hopefully we've done everything we can to make sure that this step doesn't fail for you. And so now, I'm gonna delete some files that I made earlier. And we have our course folder with our LAZs and our XML data and the course file that we've gotten from the game. So now with this, we can go try to process the LiDAR. So by clicking on the process LiDAR tab inside of the tools, you can see there are some advanced options here. But I wouldn't recommend changing any of these unless someone on the forum recommends that you need to. Um, but essentially what they are is map scale represents how much terrain detail to use, but it comes at an extreme cost of the resources in the game. And I found that using this number 2.0 gives you a good quality of giving good bunker contours and reading the greens correctly without overwhelming the tool. Um, so I wouldn't change that unless you need to make it like four. And so for this, bigger means less. And so a two is about this size and a four would be double that. Um, and an eight would be double that again. And because of the way that area works, it's a square. So a four will use one quarter the amount of resources in the editor as two does. But again, you don't really need to change it. The force LIDAR EPSG projection is something that is there in case all of the automated tools fail us. And so if you're really interested, you can look for what an EPSG is. And basically it's these little codes that um, define a bunch of numbers that tell you how to turn lat latitude, longitude into things. And so for instance, if we search for Ohio, we can see that there's a bunch of numbers that we don't understand with Ohio North and Ohio South. And, and what these are, slightly different iterations of each of the projections. Um, and if we can't find this information for you in the LiDAR data, then you might want to ask for help on the forums or ask someone who provided you the LiDAR files, like if you custom ordered them from your local government, double check what um, projection they gave you and they should be able to answer. Even with delays, you should be able to contact the United States government, for instance, and say, hey, I have this point cloud and I, I'm not sure what uh, projection it's in. Could you help me or provide me with an EPSG code? And a lot of the times that's what you need. Uh, and people seem really eager to help, which is nice. And so this is available if the automated process fails. And then furthermore, if your data uses a non-standard unit, like for instance, Ohio South is exclusively in feet pretty much, and the US surveyor foot, which is what this means, 
which is slightly different from other different units like the international foot. Um, so if your data doesn't quite line up and you find out it uses a non-standard unit, what you would enter here is the unit override. So for instance, if it were meters, you would enter 1.0 because this is in meters now. But if it's the international foot, I believe it's 3048, and then the surveyor foot's like six something, you gotta look it up, um, because it has slightly more digits. And so you may not realize it, but even a digit this far out, because of the amount of distance that these frames go, it does matter. And so it can make your courses off by as much as like, uh, a mile but the good news is is that it seems about 90% of LiDAR just doesn't need this so let's just go ahead and select our LiDAR I put that in directly in my course directory so I'll go ahead and select it and now it's gonna start working and churning out the data so with FroDaddy's question about how long does it take to process the LiDAR you can see that from the time that it says processing LAZ to when it says the next line about EPSG, that's how long it took to unpack the file. And so you can see here that it's about five seconds per file, which isn't too bad for us. But what this is doing is it's going through every single file and every single metadata and printing out important information for us um, that we can use to debug if something goes wrong. Um, and then eventually, You'll see it move on once it's processed every LiDAR file you've put in that directory, and it'll do a visualization. Then it will look on OpenStreetMap to see if a course is there. And then the last step it does is I've made a feature that gives you um, a map quest view of the course with satellite. And this is really critical because this image on the left is what we have to draw the box around. But sometimes it's hard to read, like you can notice these stripes really obstruct what the course looks like and make it look not that great. But if we look at it on the right, you can see, oh, hey, you know, that's my course. Oh, okay, so that's, I know that road, I know that road, so, all right, yeah, I know where my course is. And if this panel here on the right doesn't appear, then you, or, or it doesn't match what you expect, it probably means something's gone wrong with your projection and that you should go back to this panel and you can right click copy all and that will put it on your clipboard and you can ask for help somewhere. Uh, and people should be able to help you look for and figure out what went wrong because it should be a very, very close match between the two image panes. And so here, now that I see my course, I'm going to include everything. There's no reason for me not to really. So I'm going to click and drag, and I'm going to go all the way up to make sure I cover this tip of the course here, and all the way over to make sure I cover down here. And so I'll get a bunch of buildings and highways and stuff, but that doesn't really bother me. So I'll click there. I'll double check my box. I like it. So I'll go ahead and click accept. And so now it's going and it's saying that it's selecting only the needed data data from the LIDAR and it's generating the height map for us. And hi, Victory Lane Sports. Nice to see you here. We're on opposite ends for once. And so this part may take a while, um, but it hopefully shouldn't take too long. Um, and I guess everyone should be uh, kind of surprised about uh, how quickly we can do this um, because the golf courses take up such a little amount of space that we can actually remove and not process a lot of the data and only process what we need. Okay, so it looks like that worked. We generated a height map whatever that is we wrote files we saved a mask in our folder okay and we saved our data okay so now it says to edit our mask 
dot png. Okay, well, let me see what that is. So I'll go to my course folder and I have this thing called mask. And what I like to use is something called Paint 3D, which is a free newer version of Paint. And if we look at this, wow, look at that. It's, it's our course. Like, so what we're seeing here is we took the LiDAR data and it has something called intensity usually, and that's how bright the reflection is. And because plants reflect infrared light, but bunkers don't and water doesn't, we can actually zoom in and see the beginnings of our outlines of our greens and bunkers. And like there's a few trees and like there's a water hazard. And so it's like pretty cool to see that we've visualized the course at this point. Um, and, and so like you can see that it's like it's there and like it's the course we wanted. And so the reason why we bring in the mask is that we've selected a huge area around the outside of the course. And if we were to bring all that in and we consider all of this important as the green slope, it doesn't really get us anything that we want to publish in the game because it takes up a lot of information in the course files. There isn't an efficient way and that is not an efficient way for me to bring in the height data that's very compact. And so in the, the course basically has to go through and click every single point of data as if you were sculpting it by hand, but we're doing it from the computer and we're doing a couple hundred thousand million clicks. So you can see that <laughs> it's actually very detailed but it can take up resources. And so the way that I've worked around this is that we'll get rid of all the data that we don't need for playability. And so what we'll do is we'll click on the marker and we'll click on bright red, which is this one. And it has to be the brightest red. And then we'll make our brush wider. And then we'll just go over here and what I like to do is I like to, oops, and if you mess up, you can control Z. I just like to go around the outside of the mask real quick and just make sure that I get that border nice and covered and see like there's a hole, fill that hole in, make sure that corner's filled and go up and it's very relaxing. All right, so all of the corners are now covered. So now I'm just gonna start painting in and it's up to you how much you want to get into the course. And because we're doing this live, I'm just gonna be very quick about it. But it really doesn't matter too much as long as you don't go into the actual playable areas of the course. Like you can see here, I'm going around and I'm erasing these apartment buildings. And don't leave any holes because it, like this, this will show up as a, high resolution terrain and it'll be a little wasteful. And I'll leave the driving range. That'll be fine. Practice areas, erase this, erase the senior center. And you can see I clipped onto the course, so I'm gonna hit Control Z and undo it and just go and do that one again. All right, perfect, looks great. So when you save, just press Control S and you'll notice the little asterisk goes away and it saves it in exactly the format that we need for the data import. So now that this is done, we go back to the tool, we go to the Import Terrain and Features tab and here we can see there's a lot of different options and so the ones that are important to us right now at this stage are the course options. We don't have any greens or fairways, so those aren't important. Auto elevation offset, unless you have a good reason to leave this unchecked, you should check it. And what this does is when we import the land, 
if your land happens to be really high relative to the rest of the area around it, like it was built on a little hill or mountain, we'll lower it so that the, um, thank you, Captain Shanker for the follow. We'll lower the elevation so that it matches the game's lowest elevation. And it really is only there to make the camera in the editor work better, but it, it does make it work much better. Um, auto position and rotate is an old feature um, that we had for uh, trying to fit courses that were wider than the 2000 by 2000 meter limit in the course designer. And we did a bunch of complicated math, well I did, to try to fit the course into that little box shape and rotate it and shift it. But it turns out that when you edit the course in OpenStreetMap, if you define what's called line hole, then there's a bug in the editor and it will actually expand the map to cover this area for you. So you don't have to worry about it at all. Um, and then add background terrain, we'll talk about in a second, but I'm gonna unclick it for now um, because this sacrifices resources for uh, Usability. Oh, sorry, I dumped my water. All right. And we're back. So I'll uncheck it just for a demonstration. So now we're ready. So we'll go ahead and select an import. So this is the folder that I've been working out of. So I'll just select it. And this is where I know my mask and the data are. So I'll let it go. It says loading data, filling holes in height map. Yep. All right, that's the map scale we set earlier. Finding valid masked points and removing holes in high detail terrain. So right now what it's doing, and you can see the thinking cursor, is it's going through the LiDAR data and making sure that every single possible hole in the data is filled and that it makes a nice smooth plane for the ground to build your course on. If we didn't have this, then it's possible that different areas of the courses would have little pitfalls or holes that you would have to work around. But because of this feature, it goes through and it makes nice smooth ground planes for us. And then the next thing it does is if OpenStreetMap <laughs> is selected, then it will look on OpenStreetMap if the course is defined and bring that data in. And then it tells us that it moved the course to the lowest valid elevation. And it did that by shifting the course down three meters. And this course is you know, near sea level and so forth. And so it's not really important. And it says it's done rendering course preview. So now we'll go to course tools and look, there's our image. And you can see here that this is a little bit of the mask that I forgot. And so you could go in basically paint that out and then save it again and rerun it. But it, this isn't a big deal. So, all right, we have some terrain. So let's export the course. And what I like to do is because I pin my courses folder to the golf club, I can just go here and I can save the course directly into the game's files. So I'll do that. I'll save and now the game should be there. So I'll turn on my Xbox controller and we'll go and we'll launch the game and we'll see what we made. Unpublished courses, Rancho, all right. And you'll notice the screenshots don't update, but that's something that's basically done when the course is first made and then published. So it doesn't take a lot to uh, sort of uh, have that update. And so you can see now it's loading and eventually it will shift. And wow, look at that. This is the ground layer for our course. And this is exactly what we've mapped out and masked out. And so you can see that with the um, overall course, this course fits pretty well, so it wouldn't have had to expand. But at this point, without any open street map, 
You may see your course cut off, and that's something that we'll address later. But for now, let's take a look at some of the cool different features that we have. So like you can zoom in and there are very recognizable things like this is a bottom of a water hazard. And then I believe there's a green right here. And we can zoom out. This is the road that I shank balls into that runs along the course all the time. Or I used to. Let's see what else there is. Here's the driving range. You can see that it's nice and flat. And overall, like everything's there, but you'll notice that other than water hazards and sort of other things, it's a little hard to navigate and work around. Like maybe this is a green, you know, I don't really know. Is this a what is that? Uh, and so the next thing that I like to do is I like to start editing the course on OpenStreetMap, which we can go and do now. So while we're moving over to OpenStreetMap, does anyone have any more questions about this part of the LiDAR tutorial and just basically getting our feet on solid land. And I might have to log in again. Nope, I'm good. The CLV is asking, it, uh, is it possible if good LiDAR isn't available to just import OpenStreetMap data into a flat plot? And yes, that's something that we absolutely, or I made work because a lot of the times LiDAR isn't available or it may be your preference that you want to save resources and really decorate the course. And so let me um, get my... Uh, Log in here. Okay. And I'm just going to hide real quick while I do this, just to make sure. All right. And we're in. All good now. So now what we'll do is we'll do a quick walkthrough through the OpenStreetMap editor, at least that how it exists today. Um, and so now I'll go over to our course which is right here. And if you zoom in, you can see there's nothing. So this course hasn't been mapped yet. And that's good. Uh, a lot of the times if you have a map and it's already made, you might find that it wasn't made or it wasn't made to the accuracy that we need or that it doesn't use the golf tags. And so after you log in, you can click edit. And this brings up the edit pane 
and they have guides and things to walk you through but what we'll do is we'll start on a few things so the first one is is this most recognizable water hazard i can zoom in and you can see eh, it 